Director Williams, Wolf, Here. Hartman, Here. Adam, Here. Richardson, Here. Lizaldi, oh he's gone, Mosby, Here. Bennett, Here. Clark, Here. Murillo, Here. Waterfield, Here. Here. Sierra, Here. and Chair Lavanino.
I don't have any sound on my end. I can't. There you go. Man, it's been a while since I was the chair. How's that? <laughs> Thanks a lot, Steve. <laughs> you don't want me to hear. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's probably better off you don't. <laughs> it's easier to vote that way. All right. So, really? so all we did so far is call to order and have the Pledge of Allegiance, which I saw you join in in. So we have approval. The minutes been seconded, and we'll do a roll call. All right. With okay. Director Adam. Director Wolf? Aye. Adam? Aye. Hartman? Aye. Richardson? Aye. Mosby? Aye. Bennett? Aye. Clark? Abstain. Murillo? Aye. Waterfield? Abstain. Aye. Sierra? Aye. And Chair Lavanino? Aye. Motion passes 902. All right. Uh, takes us to our administrative agenda. Does anybody have any items that they wish to pull? Supervisor Wolf. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to pull item A1. A1. Anybody else? And do we have any items from the public? No. No All right. items. Can you read in A1, please? Mm -hmm. A1. <coughs> Notice of violation report. Receive and file the summary of notices of violation issued and penalty re re revenue received during the months of March and April 2018. In addition, receive and file the addendum summary of notices of penalty revenue received during the month of January 2018. Director Wolf. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> there is uh, there's a few things in here that are concerning to me, and I um, would like some information. Um, and they all re, um, re regard um, Greco oil and gas. And um, for each one, there is noted the source of violation is violation violated requirements for oil and gas operations based on a settlement agreement, one of nine. So if you go through this, there's <clears throat> a $10,000 payment, a $10,000 payment, a $10,000 payment, a $40,000 payment, um, and another $10,000 payment. And you know, I've looked at I've looked at these reports for many years, and I've never seen anything um, quite as substantial as what I'm seeing today. So my question is. Um, the, the statement that it's a settlement agreement. So I don't know um, where, where that was made and how does this board um, get to get that information? Okay, uh, thank you for asking about this. Uh, it was different uh, with the settlement agreement and the payment process here. It's part of our mutual settlement program. It's the same program that we've always had. However, we did update the template for the settlement agreement based on council's guidance. And when you look at the footnotes included in these tables, you will see a number of violations. Yes. All of those are various violations. And right. we grouped up the violations over a certain period of time and negotiated with the source on a settlement to a uh, penalty associated with all of those. When we came to an agreement on what the total amount would be, we were requested by Greca to do a payment program in order for them to um, meet the financial responsibility of that settlement. So we originally received two payments of $10,000. I believe it was two before we had the settlement agreement in place. And then we were moving forward with pay seven payments of 40000 for the remainder of that settlement agreement. So um, it's a lot of funding coming in from Greca. Uh, we're positive in the sense that we're actually getting the settlement fees from this source and we're reaching their entertainment with those violations and we're reaching, we're resolving the penalty associated with it. Ideally, we would like the source to contribute the entire amount with one payment, but we felt like this was a negotiable uh, position that we could afford as long as they continue to submit the settlement uh, one payment at a time. And they have been on, on schedule for that. So I guess if I could, Mr. Chair, so whenever I, when I, what I'm used to is that when, that when there's a settlement agreement, the board is aware, <clears throat> aware of that and we meet in closed session. Oh, so this, we, so was this a different group? Is this a different 
um, this is committee. our mutual settlement process for all of our violations. Okay, and so that's the different committee. It, it's not a committee. It's the APCO's authority. Okay. And is there any <clears throat> authority that this board has to know what was going on? Is it through their minutes, or how do we how do we become aware of the information that they heard to come up with a settlement agreement? Um, Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, board member Wolf. The settlement authority and enforcement authority belongs to the to the director of APCD, the control officer. Uh, your board is the legislative body of the district, and um, while you could authorize enforcement proceedings uh, through council to go sue somebody and enforce the law, typically uh, here and in, in, in other districts, it's done directly by the executive officer. And uh, under the statute, uh, the, the control officer can settle cases and such settlements uh, preclude prosecution by any other law enforcement officer, including the district attorney and the attorney general's office. And that's been in place for as long as I've uh, been working here. So um, the reason this says settlement agreement, I, I actually missed that. I didn't notice that change. But what happened was about a year or so ago, uh, we forever we've been having a mutual settlement letter, which is almost a little mini agreement to settle a case. Uh, we just have the source sign it and return it and then they pay the fine, and then that's the end of it. It was simple, it worked perfectly for years, and then finally one time somebody signed it, sent it back, and then didn't pay. And then we called them several times, and they still wouldn't pay. Well, we had a, an agreement that said it was dismissed and settled as soon as they paid, so we realized that because it had never been a problem, we never fixed it, but once we realized there was a hole in our, our game, we had to tighten up the settlement agreement, or tighten up the settlement letter. So what we did was we made it more enforceable, added from pretty standard provisions. I shopped around to a couple other districts, got the standardized clauses, and put that together. It's slightly longer now than the letter. I think we might be using some discretion on whether we bother to do that in every case, because most people have, you know, they just send you the check, and then, you know, and then we close out the case. And once it's settled, they get protection under the statute. Once Aaron, as the control officer, settles a case, they get complete protection from any other prosecution. So that's an important settlement for them. In this one case, we realized it wasn't fully implemented until the check was sent. And so what we had to do is uh, tighten up the agreement, uh, as other districts already had. And uh, that's now been done. It's, it, although it's really just a fancy version of the settlement letter we've been using for years, except now uh, the strategy is um, if they don't pay, we can uh, file an action in court to enforce it. And we, you know, it's a pretty simple lawsuit. We talked about it in-house quite a bit at council. And so that kind of enforcement action, plus I don't know if we threw in attorney's fees. I don't think we did. But it, it's really a, just a sort of a growth of business as usual. I, I think but it doesn't uh, go to the maybe board. I'm not stating my question clear enough. Um, uh, you know, there obviously is some process that we go through to get the funds back when there's a violation. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is different. And my question is, there's been a process, there's been a settlement agreement. I don't know even how much the settlement agreement is. We'll probably be seeing it on these uh, reports. But I'm wondering, as a body, why we can't just get a memo or something that set tells us clearly what were the violations over a period of time, um, what was the agreement, and when will, when will they be paying it? And, and again, because this is so out of the norm. And I think it's our response, I think it's our duty to know what, what the settlement agreement was. So the, all the violations that you see on these tables, they are all part of our mutual settlement program. Correct. So all of those have, now we use the form that Bill referenced for all of our mm -hmm. violations and our settlement. Uh, we have, they're, they're public records for sure, and it's something that we have just historically <coughs> never provided, copies of all the mutual settlement agreements to the board. Um, but they are part of public records. If people are interested, we can definitely make that available. Okay. I would, I would be interested to okay. know what the, what the ultimate settlement is, rather than seeing it come piecemeal like we're, we're seeing it. So... If you could, if you could provide that, that would be great. Hello. 
Oh, thanks. Hello, members of the board. Um, my name is Caitlin McNally, the Compliance Division Manager at the APCD. And um, to answer your question, for this specific agreement, the total amount was $240,000. Uh, and the agreement was six payments, uh, one per month over six months. So that would be ending in August of this year. Uh, we had a little mix up where Greca made some payments early. So that changed. That's why you see some odd amounts. But the the agreement was $40,000 each payment for six months. Thank you um, for that. Um, and I don't want to belabor this, but so there was an agreement that was made. It would be interesting to know what was the original amount, what was the agreement, and then the payment schedule. So the, um, the negotiation process is not public record, but okay. the final amount agreed to in our settle violation settlement agreement was two hundred and forty thousand okay. dollars. So uh, you can't tell us what the original fines were. Um, so I, I can tell you that it did not get reduced. Um, so okay. so okay. Thank yes. you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. So do you still want like something as an no, email because, or no? Because um, are you good? I think that I'm I'm good. Okay. Um, but I think in the future, with, when we get things like this, rather than having to go through all this, yeah. just have a little memo that goes along with this violation report to, ex an, to explain it. It's not normal that we enter into penal, uh, payment programs with the violators. So mm -hmm. we can summarize the total, okay. and then it could be followed with subsequent months where it just shows the payment amount. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Uh, not seeing anything else on the administrative agenda, and there's no public comment on the administrative agenda. Can I get a motion to move A1 and 2? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Roll call. Director Wolf? Aye. Adam? Aye. Hartman? Aye. Richardson? Aye. Mosby? Aye. Bennett? Aye. Clark? Aye. Murillo? Aye. Waterfield? Aye. Aye. Sierra? And Chair Lavanino. Aye. Motion passed in 11 0. All right. That takes us to item six, which is public comment. Do we have any public comment? We have no public comment. No public comment. That takes us to item seven, which is the director's report. All right. Good afternoon. I have a few items to brief your board on. The first up good news Ventura County Air Pollution Control District Board approved the receipt of $350,000 from the California Air Resources Board through a supplemental environmental program to fund the next marine vessel speed reduction program. This has been a long going challenge for us as far as how are we gonna find funds outside of our area and Ventura County took the lead in defining this project and we're successful in working with um, a source that actually it was uh, Heinz Craft who was the source of funding. They violated a, an emission regulation related to vinegar cleaning products of all things. Uh, they looked through the SEP list of eligible products and made the decision to fund the marine vessel speed reduction project. So that's good news. Uh, we plan to use these funds for two years of incentive programs to reduce vessel speed throughout and around the Santa Barbara channel. Uh, partners are now discussing whether we'll use a fleet average approach uh, versus awarding funds on each vessel transit in the channel as we have historically done. And we'll be bringing this item back to your board at the June meeting uh, to discuss the Santa Barbara County's participation in the next round of pilot projects. Spring has been a very busy public outreach uh, month for us. We have had staff attend numerous events throughout the county. Later in the presentation related to our incentive project, Jim Fredrickson will speak um, on some of these aspects related to upcoming grants that we'll be awarding next fiscal year. But part of our community air protection program, we participated in four Earth Day events in Santa Barbara, Guadalupe, Marion Medical Center, and Cottage Hospital. We also were up at the Lompoc Spring Fest, and uh, on June 2nd, we'll be at the Santa Maria Elks Rodeo Parade. So these are just a great opportunity for us to get out and around the entire community, have individuals get a better understanding of who we are, uh, not just during wildfires. Uh, so uh, the resources we have and uh, get to know our staff as well. Another public event that we've been participating with, and it's been pretty active over the last week and a half, it's related to State Lands Commission and the decommissioning process for Platform Holly. 
Um, we've been working with state lands on the three years renewal of their operating permits for South Elwood Field. State lands needs these permits for the decommissioning of oil and gas operations related to Platform Holly, EOF, and Piers 421 lease. These permits are now finalized with the APCD. At the request of public comment, the APCD held a public hearing on April 24th to describe our permit renewals and in particular staff's recommendation for H2S monitoring requirements. Following that, I arranged a conference call on May 9th with State Lands Commission and the City of Goleta to discuss odoring, odor monitoring requirements associated with the decommissioning process as well as odor impacts from other sources, specifically in the West Goleta area. During this call, we agreed that there is a role for a mobile monitor station outside of the decommissioning efforts to better assess the impacts uh, from oil and gas and other activities as well. Last Monday, district staff participated or attended the State Lands Committee town hall meeting on the decommissioning process. We were able to, at this point, develop an information sheet on odoring requirements associated with the APCD permit, make those available to all who attended, and also place that on our website. So now we're in the process of working with all the agencies to see what type of fiscal contribution could be provided by all of those agencies to enable us to move forward with the mobile monitor. Ultimately, this tool would be something we could use, obviously, throughout the decommissioning process, West Goleta, but it's mobile, it can go throughout the county and serve any of the needs that we may have in the, on the future. Next item, the CAPCOA Spring Membership Retreat. Just a second, uh, Commissioner Hartman. Thank you. Uh, two questions Director. about that. Um, is it correct then that the EOF is no longer monitoring and has not been monitoring for some time? Or? No, the EOF actually has 14 fence line and on-site H2S monitors that are operating and have been operating even when the facility has been mothballed. So that information has been provided through the data acquisition system to the APCD and it is actually extremely helpful when in 2016 we had the impact from that water well uh, that hit an H2S pocket and significantly impacted the community. And second, are you still looking for a location for the mobile uh, monitor once we get it? Well, once we have it in place, we're definitely going to be working with the city of Goleta on potential locations, different community parks, but we want it to be mobile and able to maneuver around where we're having the complaints occur so we can better assess the actual air quality impacts when APCD staff are not there. So, so could you describe the requirements that you're looking for in an appropriate site? Well, I will have a better opportunity once I know exactly what my mobile monitor looks like. I'm shooting for the stars. There's a mobile monitor that's on wheels and is a van that's self-sufficient that can just be moved around and not even dependent on electricity. Another layer down from that would be a mobile monitor trailer that you could tow behind but um, have solar and battery backup. And then if we're not successful in securing enough funds for those two options, it would be a trailer that could be towed around and located where it would need to be plugged into electricity. So um, I can't now speak on exactly what we're likely to get, but I'm hopeful it has wheels and is uh, drivable all by itself. All right, moving on down the list. Uh, this week I've been up at uh, Squaw Creek Resort. It's an amazing place to go to a conference if any of you ever have the opportunity to go there. CAPCOA held their spring membership retreat there. And it was participated by myself and the 35 other air pollution control officers from around California. US EPA and California Air Resources Board were all in attendance. Uh, they, we talked many topics, but I thought most relevant to our location. The Little Hoover Commission provided a presentation on their healthy forest efforts. They've been uh, working on healthy forest, ways to move forward, and the promotion of prescribed burns. So we had a long conversation as it relates to prescribed burns. And Senator Jackson's proposed piece of legislation was also discussed. There's an uh, aspect in the proposed legislation that talks about the Air District's role in conjunction with California Air Resources Board role on uh, the use of prescribed burns to create healthy forests. Another item that we discussed was incentives and funding, including the statewide wood smoke uh, reduction program. 
and a slew of other pieces of legislation that the state passed last year to uh, award more funding at the local level, and Jim will be giving you a spotlight on that in a second. And then there was a lot of conversation on AB 617, California's Community Air Protection Program, and I briefed your board on that at our last meeting in, in May. I was uh, requested and presented on two items. I talked about the Thomas Fire and our local air quality impacts and how we responded to that. And then the second presentation was on cannabis odor abatement. I was able to spotlight Carpinteria uh, and this one greenhouse that I had the opportunity to tour and to see their vapor phase um, system that was in place. And that was very informative to air districts that haven't seen that in that application. That application has been used elsewhere throughout the state, landfills, wastewater treatment plants, but the APCOs there were not familiar with the use of that technology for uh, the growing of cannabis. Um, and lastly, I'd like to uh, announce new staff. I have, I'm, I'm very excited to introduce Barbara Schindler. I don't know, oh, is Barbara here? Okay, darn. Uh, we have a new- Hopefully she didn't call in sick today. <laughs> we have a new accounting technician. She has okay. over 10 years experience in accounting and she's recently relocated back to the area. She's from Santa Barbara and she is relocated back from Porter Ranch. And then lastly, I want to congratulate Jim Fredrickson in his recent promotion to Supervisor of Planning and Grants in our Technology and Environmental Assessment Division. And that concludes my report. Very good. All right, we're gonna move on to our discussion items. Item eight, if the clerk could read in item one, please. Item one, <clears throat> overview of voluntary clean air grant and in incentive programs. Receive a presentation on the status of the district's clean air grants and incentive programs and discuss potential program changes to be proposed as part of the June 21st, 2018 board meeting. I'm just gonna hand the baton over to Jim and, and let All him right. take, take it away. Thank you, Aaron. Good afternoon, chair, board members. Today I'm gonna give you a presentation, uh, an update of our clean air funding programs and talk specifics about implementing five of our existing programs and two new programs. <clears throat> uh, since 1988, we've invested almost $34 million of state and local funds into partnerships with several hundred businesses and government agencies countywide. The advancement of cleaner technologies with our cleaner grants has led to significant emission reductions, especially for mobile sources. There are, <clears throat> there are three primary sources of funding that we have used for our grant programs. The California Air Resources Board or CARB funds in red are derived from smog check and new tire purchase fees. We use, we use these funds primarily for our off-road equipment replacement, marine injury powers, and school bus replacements. The Department of Motor Vehicle Revenue in green are derived from registration fees. We currently use these funds for our school bus and old car buyback programs. The local mitigation funds in blue are collected from permitted businesses that were required to mitigate their excess emissions, and we've used these funds for various uh, grant projects. This is a general flow chart for most of our grant projects. First, grant applicants must submit extensive documentation and the district verifies that applications are complete. We input that information into a state database and then analyze and rank the projects based on emission reductions, cost effectiveness, and other factors. Uh, we inspect the app applicant's existing equipment to verify that it operates and matches the application. Successful applicants are offered grants and they must provide a scope of work. Grantees are required to fund part of the project cost and their projects are subject to cost effectiveness limits established by CARB. Grantees have four months to obtain the new equipment for district inspection and the district also verifies proper destruction of the old equipment. Grantees complete the reimbursement process and must report to us annually for the life of the project and are also subject to audit inspections. And lastly, the district tracks the project with both local and state databases to ensure that the emission reductions are achieved. We currently operate five programs and added two new programs for next fiscal year and I will briefly describe them in the next 13 slides. Moyer is a volunteer incentive program that has provided $8.7 million in state funds from CARB for cleaner than required technologies to public and private owners of vehicles, equipment, and engines countywide. We partner with applicants and execute a grant agreement with a grant amount based on their calculated emission reductions. 
The 20th year of the Moyer program starts this summer and will be focused on off-road equipment replacement, marine engine repowers, and possibly school bus replacements. This fiscal year, we also received Moyer State Reserve grant funds that were specifically targeted for school bus replacements. We selected a project with the Lompoc Unified School District to fund the replacement of six diesel buses that range from 28 to 32 years old with five 2018 compressed natural gas buses and one 2018 diesel bus. The total project cost was over a million dollars and was basically split between the Air District and the School District. Here is the Moyer off-road equipment replacement project that we completed last month in partnership with Rancho Laguna Farms there in Santa Maria. That's there. We provided a $75,000 grant to replace their 1998 Case Ag Tractor on the left and on the right with a 2016 Kubota Ag Tractor in the center. The total cost of the project was $123,000. The district paid 61% and Rancho Laguna Farms paid 39%. Over the past seven years, we've completed 43 off-road equipment replacement projects and on average, the district paid 55% of the total project costs with 45% paid for by the grantees. Here is the Moyer Marine Diesel Engine Repower Project for 2017. We provided a $75,000 grant to Casagnola Tug Services to repower two main diesel engines on the largest commercial vessel in the Santa Barbara Harbor. We replaced both port and starboard 2001 Caterpillar diesel engines on the left with 2017 Cummins diesel engines on the right. The total pro cost of the project was $184,000. The district paid 41% and the grantee paid 59%. Over the past 19 years, we've completed 52 Moyer Marine Repower projects, and on average, the district has paid 59% of the total project costs, with 41% paid for by the grantees. <clears throat> for 17 years, we've helped county school districts comply with state fleet requirements and reduce the exposure of toxic diesel exhaust to thousands of students by completing 33 bus replacements and 33 retrofit projects. This fiscal year, we have replaced uh, Orchid Union School District's 1985 diesel school bus with a 2018 diesel school bus. And next fiscal year, we plan to work with school districts on replacing their old diesel buses with battery electric school buses. For 25 years, the old car buyback program has helped over 6,800 vehicle owners and continues to have steady participation. It's specifically designed to accelerate the retirement of high polluting cars, model year 1994 and older, these cars account for only 10% of the total fleet of all on-road vehicles, but are responsible for 50% of the air pollution. We will consider increasing the model year to 1995 and older this coming fiscal year. Our EV program is now in its seventh year, and we've helped purchase and install 23 publicly accessible charging stations. Nine of those stations are located in the North County and 14 stations in the South County. Of the 23 charging stations, 17 are level two, and six are, are level three DC fast chargers. At the June board meeting, we will bring a proposal to expand the program to allow grant funding for private and nonprofit multi-unit dwellings. Here is a map that shows the location of the 23 stations funded. The green squares are level two chargers, yellow squares are level three DC fast chargers, and the blue squares have both a level two and a level three charger located there. The number of stations at that location are in the parens. The Wood Smoke Pilot Program has been successful and the district is now eligible to receive $250,000 of funding from CARB to expand the program. We will seek, board, uh, we'll seek approval of the funds at the June board meeting along with modifying the program to provide additional funding for low income residents. This table summarizes all the grant programs, funding sources and projects that were funded in fiscal year 2017-2018 including both program and administrative fund expenditures. The grants board letter has a similar table on page six. In 2017, CARB approved the FARMER program, which is the acronym for Funding Agricultural Replacement Measures for Emission Reductions. As the name implies, the FARMER funds are dedicated solely for ag-related projects. We're, co we're coordinating with the county ag commissioner to help promote this new program. We will seek approval at the June board meeting to accept the CARB funds and implement this program.
Community Air Protection is another new program that CARB approved in 2017. We have been doing extensive outreach as required by CARB for this program, including participating in local events to low in low-income communities, a news release, a new webpage, outreach materials, and placing bus ads in Lompoc, Santa Maria, and Guadalupe transit buses. So far, we have gathered several hundred surveys, both online and from public events, with ideas on how best to implement this program in their communities. Uh, <clears throat> we will report back at the June board meeting. <clears throat> excuse me. We will report back at the June board meeting to present the survey results and our next steps, which include getting board approval to accept the funds from CARB. Here is a map of the six public outreach events that were attended in April throughout the county's low-income communities, including Ryan Park in Lompoc, Paco Park in Guadalupe, and Franklin School in Santa Barbara. The seventh event we'll be attending is the Elks Rodeo Parade in Santa Maria on June 2nd. In conclusion, our clean air funding programs provide substantial value by cost effectively reducing emissions, especially for mobile sources, providing financial assistance to county residences, businesses, and public entities, and improving the air that all of us breathe. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions. Okay. Do we have any public comment on this item? No public comment. Okay. Do we have any questions from the board for staff? Wow. All right. I mean, it's a <laughs> heck of a presentation. All right, I'll, is this just receive and file? Yeah. Do we need a motion for that or can we just receive and file it? I received it, you filed it, all right, we're good. <laughs> Let's move on to the next, next item, <clears throat> item number two. Item two, fiscal year 2018-19 proposed Sorry. budget. Consider the fiscal year 2018-19 proposed budget yeah. as follows. 2A, receive the proposed budget for fiscal year 2018-19. 2B, hold public hearing to accept comments and provide direction to staff regarding changes desired by the board. And 2C, schedule a budget adoption hearing for June 21st, 2018. All right. Okay, Aaron. All right, as you just heard, this is the first of two public hearings on the proposed uh, fiscal year 2018-19 budget for the Air Pollution Control District. We held a public workshop on April 17th and um, it was attended by staff. We didn't have any participants from the public in attendance. Uh, we are also receiving written comments, and to date we have not received any written comments either. Uh, this afternoon, I will be presenting along with Tina Aguilar, manager of administrative division. And I'm not sure on the total number of slides I could look there. I think we have around 17 slides total, and I'll be walking through that. I know you love that, Peter. <laughs> you can tell he's not the chair, right? <laughs> and what I'll be doing first is walking through uh, the more of the overview and talking about our accomplishments in the last fiscal year. And then I'll be handing the baton over to Tina, who will walk, walk through the nuts and bolts of the numbers in our proposed budget. So next slide, please. It's awkward presenting here with the presentation behind you, too. You Good could podium. swap Change seats. Yeah. I'll go over here. Yeah. Much better. Just have to make sure I can see Tina. All right, so fiscal year 1819, a total budget of 11 million. Uh, but that does include pass-through funds, grants that we do not have authority as far as how they're allocated. Legislature defines exactly how the pass-through funds are, are to be spent, um, mainly for emission reduction projects that you just heard about from Jim in the last presentation. Our operating budget is $7,857,000. It's a reduction, a small reduction, a 0.5% reduction from our last year. Uh, we did see an increase, and the increase of our total operating budget is predominantly inspired by all of the legislation that was passed last year. Uh, grants, one-time grants, the pass-through money, has been highly valuable throughout California, and it's been something that CAPCOA and I have personally been advocating for as much as when those funds become available, I want to make sure we get our fair share of those. Uh, historically speaking, most of the money goes to the large air district, Santa, um, Santa Barbara, I wish. Um, San Francisco, the Bay Area, South Coast, and San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District. Those are the, the air districts that see the majority of the funding. The rest is fought after from the medium and rural districts. 
In the proposed budget, uh, we are proposing to reduce our staff down from 43, which we have on the books with this current fiscal year, down to 37. Uh, and it is a balanced budget. We are not using any strategic reserves for our ongoing cost. And I think just to take a step back to, before I go to the next slide, the way we go about our budget, and this is included in our budget message, we, we look at all of the revenue that we have at our disposal that we can utilize for our operating budget. We forecast out our revenues and then we match that with our expenditures, including salaries and benefits, to ensure that we do have a balanced budget. So as many of you have heard, uh, this year is a little different than the way we've been going about things in the past two years since I've been here. Uh, we've had struggles over the last two years with our changing revenue associated with oil and gas activity, predominantly when we had the failure of the All-American Pipeline. We had to respond quickly uh, to the revenue drop that was associated with the operations feeding into that line. Rather than responding every year on a, more of a reactive basis, we wanted to be proactive. We wanted to cast our net out five years, see what's on the horizon, see best how we can position our agency to be sustainable for the long haul. Um, so I pulled together a team of Tina and Mike Goldman and myself. We, we looked at what other districts are doing. We looked at what we see in our area as it's a change of revenue, primarily associated with the oil and gas activities. And we tried to figure out how we can organize the agency to be sustainable, not just for this year, but for the five-year duration. And that's something that I want to continue. Every year, casting the net out five years and making adjustments along the way. So um, within this budget, we have incorporated some organizational changes associated with it. We also uh, have been challenged over the last few years with recruiting and attaining or retaining uh, high-qualified staff. And that's something I'll be talking about in a second here as far as the goals of our agency to ensure that we have the competitive compensation for those staff, that when we attract the high-performing staff, we have a way of keeping them and not just training them and, and then sending them on to their next job. All right, so this is a snapshot of the specifics that are impacting our, our revenue and our expenditures, and pretty much the crystal ball that we were looking at over the five years. We have seen, as I said, a decrease in oil and gas, and then, as I mentioned, with the state land and the decommissioning of Venico, we see long-term reductions as well with oil and gas, um, and, and our anticipation is not going to stop just at what we've seen so far. More will be coming uh, following that path through the decommissioning process. So we estimate over a five-year period that we'll have an annual reduction of $620,000 for our agency. The pension costs continue to go up. We've been working with the Santa Barbara County CEO's office and have been informed that we'll have a 6% increase annually over the next five years, which totals approximately $440,000. And, and that's the additional pension that we, are, we know about. And, you know, it could go up even further from that. We, we, that, but this is the information that we have here today. And I mentioned staff recruitment. Over the past 10 years, or no, after the past year, I got my, my numbers reversed there, we've lost 10 staff. And when I lose staff, I sit down and I go through an exit interview to try to get a better understanding of uh, where they're going, why they're going, and, and you know, just to feel and see what, what we could do differently to keep those high performers. 75 or 77 of those 10 were leaving for other jobs, both in the private and the public sector, that were being compensated at a higher level. So I knew that was an issue just through my exit interviews. And we also worked with an um, outside third party form to do an assessment of the Air District's compensation as it relates to public agencies, other neighboring air pollution control districts, as well as local cities. And we found through that study that 75% of our staff are compensated below the median level, between 4.5% and 12.5% below. But with some help from a board member, we were also able to determine that it doesn't stop just with the public agencies as far as where we lie in our compensation. By looking at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the APCD salaries are actually below the growth of the total cost uh, for, of the private sector. 
So um, not only is it the public agencies, neighboring and in-county agencies that were below, but it's also the private sector as well. So those are the challenges. Those are the challenges that I see was in my responsibility to figure out, well, how do I address those challenges and make sure that as we move forward, we can still be a strong agency that we have today. So where we focused was on reorganization. I mentioned how we have 43 staff, and in order to move forward with a balanced budget, reducing that down to 37. In the long term, over a five-year period, that would actually go to 35 staff total based on um, retirements in the future, some of those positions we would not be filling. I want to maintain our current structure, the four different divisions with admin, engineering, compliance, and planning. Uh, that was something very common that I saw across the air districts. It's a planning division. It's not the T. What is T? I always go, what is T? Oh, it's technical and environmental assessment division. Well, it's now planning is my proposal. And um, <clears throat> moving the public information officer position, which is currently in our T division, to the management team. So that individual has the ability to serve all of the divisions within my agency and to be part of our conversation as we figure out how best to position um, the APCD. We lost two of our IT workers, and we have not filled those positions yet. So rather than filling those two positions, we're electing to use contractors for that service, and we've been doing that now. And we're also making a move to purchase off-the-shelf technologies that come with their own IT support. Tyler Technologies, I think, is the most significant investment that we were able to invest in this current fiscal year. And Tina and her group have been working through the implementation of that. And it's very impressive, the amount of IT support that Tyler provides. But it also has a collaboration of other users here in the community, uh, agencies that are using Tyler. So it's a nice support group uh, and that we can utilize. Proposing to bring the monitoring section into the planning division. This will assist in our long-term assessment of air quality impacts and the way we develop our, our long-term clean air plans and also assist with the deployment of sensors or monitoring devices throughout the community to get a better assessment on, on what exactly is going on. To simplify management structure, um, when we were larger, we had a lot more staff here, and we had more need for more supervisors. Now that we're going from 43 to 37, ultimately to 35, we don't need to have as many supervisors as what we have today. So reallocation of two of our current supervisors to air quality specialists or uh, principal monitoring staff and have one supervisor per division. So, um, and then, Currently, as we're structured, we have air quality specialists in the planning division, inspectors in my compliance division, and monitoring staff that now sits in administrative division. Um, we assessed other air districts and the roles and responsibilities of those, and I'm proposing that rather than having those three individual categories, they should all be air quality specialists and have the ability to have subclasses within those, but also to cross-train. So you can have a monitoring staff that's going to be helping out in planning or even compliance, for example, when we have a prescribed burn and we need to have a monitor deployed, a, per, a temporary monitor, that's something that the once known as compliance staff, now air quality specialists could go forward and implement. And the last proposal on this list is an adjustment, a pay adjustment to the median level for those positions that were identified below the median by the third party study. So 25% of the staff will not see in this proposal any increase because they've been fortunate to already be at a competitive level. But of the 75 that were below, I'm proposing to bring them up to a, a, the median level so they're more competitive with the goal of being able to re, um, attract and retain high caliber staff. So with the budget increase or the budget proposal that we see today, there is an increase associated with all the grants. And, Jim just identified a few of those with the Carl Moyer projects, the wood smoke reduction, and with that we get increased admin fees as well. We have uh, fee revenues. We have a CPI built into our program automatically. We have not had a fee increase uh, based on Rule 210 since 1991, so that's going to continue as is. Uh, we have other one-time expenditures. 
And uh, the one-time expenditures include the engineering division going 100% paperless. As you may recall, this current fiscal year, we've been archiving uh, all of our archived 800 boxes of, of file paper. We archived all of those electronically. This would take all of their current files and move them into electronic mode as well. Expanded use of per, uh, personal air sensors. This is an opportunity to use the purple air device that we had uh, some limited use during the wildfires to expand on that. It's also an opportunity, depending on the amount of participation we get from the other agencies for the mobile monitor, this could be a, a portion of the mobile monitoring that the air district could contribute towards. And um, brand awareness. Uh, I think it's real important that we, we focus on the public knowing who we are. The Thomas Fire was a really good reminder of how important air quality was and folks were going to our website, but making sure that everyone always knows where you can go to get your current air quality conditions, how to navigate through our system a little bit easier. At times I even have a little bit of a challenge working through our website and making sure that all of that is accessible. One thing I wanted to highlight with our reorganization efforts that with the savings that were identified through the reorganization, predominantly reduction of staff and then um, moving supervisors down to the line staff level long term, it will be a savings of a roughly 530000 a year. So now the next few slides I have walk through my uh, agency's accomplishments division by division just to give you a spotlight of what we've been able to accomplish this current fiscal year. So in our administrative division, uh, they've done a great job tracking our budget, making sure that we are on track with all the revenues and expenditures of our current year budget as well as building out the budget that's before you today. And that, that was building out this budget was a little bit more complicated than years prior since we did do the five-year outlook. There were a number of different scenarios that we ran to get a better understanding of what would be the best recommendation to put before your board. We have been hiring individuals uh, and training new individuals in the admin div division with a new supervisor and the accounting technician and successfully completing our, our financial audit with no audit findings and I was uh, happy to see the board recognize that as well. Um, we are processing new efficient ways of doing business. Historically, we've had our own program that we made to track our time cards. Now we're moving over to ADP, an online system that can do that for us and then work that in with the Tyler software as well. So transitioning from how we've done things in, a pa in the past to a more efficient process going forward. I um, already talked about the third party compensation plan. On the monitoring side, we operate 18 monitoring stations. Those have been up online receiving data. We've gone through our QA, QC, making sure that all that is complete and meeting the requirements of both California Air Resources Board and EPA. We saw one exceedance of the federal and state ozone standard. So we continue to see a reduction in that. But with the Thomas fire, we saw eight violations of the federal PM standard. 12 of the PM 2.5 and 54 uh, violations of the state standards. So we were, as we all know, hit very hard during that fire. And if our attainment was ever to be jeopardized based on that fire, we would go through an exceptional events process with US EPA. We're not at that point now, but we, I just want you to be aware that there is an option for exceptional events if we were ever at a non-attainment phase. And public information issuing uh, 37 press releases, participating in at least 30 media interviews. This is something that Liz and I have been talking about as far as a um, better way of tracking not only the interviews that we do, but also the placement of our press releases to get you a better idea of our reach as an agency. And co interagency coordination. Um, we've been doing quite a bit of that and successfully. It, it took us a little bit of time to get into the EOC with Thomas Fire, but once we were recognized as a need to be there, we were fully in it, and now I know Rob, Rob uh, Lewin knows our number, has my email, has my, my cell phone, so we'll be in automatically. We won't have to go through that delay again. But it's not just there. I think what, you, what I was mentioning as far as State Lands Commission and working with the City of Goleta and State Lands, interagency coordination is just expected, and it's just what we have to do to ensure that the public sees that we're all talking. Moving into engineering, performed 610 permit actions. That's up from 553 last year. So uh, we're still quite busy in, in, that, in that realm. The implementation of the new state oil and gas regulation, we actually implemented that ahead of schedule. 
Mike and his group were able to conduct two workshops in Santa Barbara and also up in North County to reach out to all of the oil and gas operators here in our region, ensure that they had easy to use fillable forms on our website so they can go and enter all that data necessary to be compliant with the rule. And we secured 97% uh, compliance by January, I believe, is when we, were, we got that, that um, compliance rate. It was very successful word, work. And when you talk to other air districts, as I just have uh, throughout the state, um, they look at us and go, wow, we got to get those forms on our district, too. So if we can only sell those forms, right, Mike? <laughs> and um, our permit compliance program, this is another huge effort for us, uh, building out our database to be even more streamlined in the future. And we're going to build off of this permit compliance database, and we're actually now, Caitlin's group is heading up a compliance module of that database to streamline operations even further. Moving into compliance, work continues with the county fire department to make improvements to the open burning program. We have over 600 inspections at permitted facilities. We responded to 369 complaints. That's up 16% from last year. So we had a lot of complaints that we were out there on the ground responding to. Uh, variance petitions continue to be active. Uh, a lot of those are associated with the shutdown of the All-American Pipeline, but we're actually trying to make even improvements with that process so they don't have to come back on such a quick frequency since it's taking a while for that pipeline to get up and, and going again. Director Wolf. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> On the um, response to pollution complaints, I'm just wondering what is your response um, rate or time to respond? Is it hours, days, weeks? Yeah, I'd like yeah. Caitlin to come up. We do have a policy on that okay. and, and a goal and a target, and she'll give you a better understanding of, of where we're at. Great. Thank you. You are very well prepared okay. to answer my questions. Proceed. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, members of the board. Um, so our goals for complaint response are three hours is our high priority goal within three hours of receiving the complaint that we at least touch, um, make contact with the complainant and then start the investigation and then in a maximum 24 hours. Uh, and we, I don't know our percentage for completion off the top of my head, but that is in the budget document. Um, if somebody has it, we have our percentages of how we are doing with completing those goals. Um, I think okay. Aaron's looking it up right I'll, now. I'll, yeah, and I'll, I'll look at that as well. Okay. Thank you for that information. You're welcome. It's on page 42. Let's see here. Actual. So on the on page 42 on the table, as far as our response time, within three hours, we hit that 83% of the time this current fiscal year, and within 24 hours, it was 93%. So we're we're doing well. We have room for improvement, though. All right, moving on. Thank, thank you for that. If I could just just note it on this same page about just going back to these settlement letters. Um, that's a pretty low percent, the 16% within 90 days. So, yep. um, and it looks like you obviously want to improve that rate, so. Definitely, we've yeah. been putting a lot of energy into this and part of it was a template that we referred to from Correct. Bill, uh, working with the one source that we talked about, trying to make sure that all of the outstanding violations are settled. It's been a huge effort on ours mm -hmm. uh, and this is a big goal for next year. Great. To address the backlog here. Thank you. You know, while I have the floor, Mr. Chair, if I could just ask another question, and that has to do with, did you ever talk to or make an application to FEMA for the time that your employees um, were working in the Thomas fire? Tina would be able to respond to that. Uh, yeah, actually, we did accumulate all the different hours that our staff spent on the Thomas fire and also the debris flow. So uh, my staff and I are currently working on that FEMA application. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for the recommendation. Well, I was just going to add, uh, Board Member Wolf, uh, per your comments in that, in that board meeting, we investigated the procedures that already were invented by the county and then used that template. And Erin was able to have her staff go back and account for the time and submit a claim. Okay, so moving on to planning, I believe. Major accomplishments here. Uh, 
specifically related to planning, we had board approval of our new uh, control measure implementation schedule as it relates to non-attainment transitional status. We awarded $1.7 million in clean air grants. That's up 14% over the last year. Our board approved Rule 360, the low NOx boiler uh, <coughs> rule, and the Marine Vessel Speed Reduction Program. This was actually in, uh, expanded up to the Bay Area. We were able to reduce over 83.5 tons of NOx. It's quite a significant increase from where we were in prior years, about a 70% increase in the amount of reductions there. And now that we have secured through Ventura County's efforts money for the next two years, we hope to go even further with that. And Congressman Lowenthal is working on a piece of legislation to move this project into a recognition uh, program versus primarily incentives, so giving them recognition as well. That concludes the achievements and, and my part of the presentation. What I'd like to do now is hand it over to Tina so she can walk you through the numbers. Good afternoon. Erin has hit on the two major efforts affecting next year's budget. The first is a long-term reorganization plan, and the second is the additional grant monies the district will be receiving for our grant programs. The total district budget increased by $744,000. Included in this is the $777,000 of additional grant funds. That means the district's operating revenue decreased by $32,000, or less than one half of a percent. This will be shown on the next slide. The district is expecting approximately the same level of fees and operating revenue as in the previous year. There are some revenue streams decreasing while others are increasing slightly, but the overall change is very minimal at less than one half percent. I know the co content on this slide is somewhat hard to see. I wanted to, I wanted to point out that the same information can be found on page 19 of the budget document. These tables illustrate to the reader the district's total budget versus its operating budget. The grant revenue next year makes up approximately 29.3% or $3.2 million of the district's total revenue, all of which is slated for grant programs as pass-through funds. Here's the operating revenue plan broken out by category. As you can see, licenses and permits continues to be the largest chunk of the district's revenue at 43%, followed by federal, state, and other grant revenue at 31%. Now on to the expenditures. Based on the long-term reorganization plan for the district, this budget cycle, we are proposing to delete six funded positions, all of which are currently vacant. The savings from unfunding these positions was offset by the proposed equity adjustments that were identified during the third party salary survey that was completed last year. As Aaron mentioned, we are anticipating that retirement costs will continue to go up approximately 6% annually over the next five years, and this savings will be eaten up by the end of that time frame. hence the reason for the long-term planning. Services and supplies increased by about $950,000. Over 80% of this increase is due to the grant program beefing up its pass-through dollars based on the additional grant monies the district will be receiving next fiscal year. The other 20% is various things. Majority of them, the one-time projects already mentioned. Brand awareness and public accessibility and an update to the district's logo and website, $50,000 archiving of the engineering division documents to continue our paperless office efforts, $65,000, and expanding the personal air sensor network, $50,000. Also, the contract for outsourcing IT services is included in next year's budget at a cost of $150,000. The district continues to watch our expenditures carefully and where the opportunity arose to tighten the belt on other SNS line items, we definitely did so. The need for additional capital assets is proposed to decrease next fiscal year, and after all the one-time projects, pass-through monies, revenues, and expenses were slated for use, the district anticipates to deposit approximately $100,000 into our operational reserve fund balance. 
As I mentioned a few slides ago, the district wanted to show what the operating budget was versus monies used for grant programs. These tables illustrate the operating pass-through monies for expenditures. As you can see, the district plans to pay out $3.2 million for grant programs as pass-through funds. That is pretty substantial increase of 31.3% or $777,000 from the current fiscal year. Here's a good illustration of the district's operating expenditure breakdown. The largest expenditure within our operating budget is salaries and benefits at 71%. Of that $5.6 million expense, approximately 1.4 million can be attributed to retirement costs. And as we already mentioned, pension costs are a large concern over the next five years. So we'll continue to watch these costs and make adjustments as needed with each budget cycle. As in previous years, a key measure of the district's fiscal health is the size of the fund balance relative to the total annual budget. With a projected total fund balance of 5.3 million or 67% of the total operating budget, we feel that the fund balances continue to be adequate and provide the district with the cushion that is necessary in case of an emergency. On this slide, you can see the fund balance categories and the associated amounts in each. I will now turn it back over to Erin so she can discuss the district goals and objectives for fiscal year 18-19. All right, this is the last slide. Right on. <laughs> I'm with you all the way, man. This is... <laughs> All right, so our key objectives for the next year, and we've already hit on a few of these, uh, improving our efficiency. We have fewer staff. We're going to have to figure out how to do things um, more efficient, more smart, smarter in the future, <laughs> um, wearing different hats, uh, trying, and that's, I think, part of the big improvement of having air quality specialists. So people don't see themselves as being siloed in one division. I want people to understand that we are uh, culturally changing slightly from where we were historically and we all need to pitch in and help out even if it says if it's not within your exact division. Uh, the mutual settlement backlog. We've put a huge effort in trying to get that program up and going again, getting it under control. We have key staff who are now working on it and we just need to continue that momentum to improve and eliminate our mutual settlement backlog. Assembly Bill 1617, Jim spoke on this as it relates to the community air protection program. For our area, the primary responsibility will be the grant programs, and we're receiving the input and trying to figure out how best to award those dollars currently. But we also have other requirements as it relates to emissions reporting and best available retrofit technology. So Take your medicine. <laughs> So working through uh, CAPCOA and working with ARB specifically, we will be implementing those rules as well. And um, next month at our June meeting, we will be discussing our air monitoring network with you and trying to make that as efficient as possible to not only assess the air quality impacts that drive our attainment, but make sure we don't have duplicating uh, monitoring sites in place and uh, have a robust network in order to protect the public that we serve. Uh, clean Air Ambassador Program. This is something that I was working on in San Luis Obispo that was very effective, utilizing interns and bringing interns in from UCSB to assist us as we conduct our public outreach with schools. We have a very big program right now working with Santa Barbara County Schools, but if we can utilize interns and expand the reach, it also assist us with public events as well. And we already talked about grants. Grants, grants, grants. I think the big thing about grants is making sure we do so in an efficient manner. And I can just imagine when you're up there and you're hearing all these additional dollars that are coming in, well, how are we going to do it with less staff? And this is going to be something that we really need to be very strategic about. But when we make a call for projects, we have to make sure that that call is a huge net that we cast out. And as Jim mentioned, working with the key stakeholders, the farm bureaus, the ag commissioners, making sure all of those entities know about the grant funding that we have available. And when we do a call, we do one call, we get all the applications, we review, and then we award. So uh, we can do so in an efficient manner. It's just expanding our scope for the call for, for projects. So that concludes our presentation. Uh, we are now open and available to answer your questions. Well, I just want to start by saying that, you know, I think 
we're probably all dealing with this at our local levels and at the county we have a program that's called Renew 22 and we're asking department heads to basically do what you're doing is, you know, looking out, finding ways to become more efficient. Um, and uh, so I really appreciate what you do. I have extreme confidence that you're running a great shop and have great employees. So, so uh, Director Adam. And I was going to compliment you on your uh, realistic uh, view of the world here and, and making a good plan and executing it. I think it's great. Thank you. Any other comments? We're all thumbs up. Uh, Director Muriel. <clears throat> Thank you, um, Ms. Arlen Janae. So um, don't forget, uh, you, you said you, finding interns from UC Santa Barbara. Our city college has an active um, environmental protection programs, and they put on a great Earth Day event recently, oh. and everyone had a lot of passion. And Westmont College as well. Oh, good. So thinking. Antioch University, there's a lot of different uh, schools. And I'm not that excited about contracting out work. Um, I love to see our people in-house with good wages. So uh, just registering that. But I, okay. I see that you're in a pickle in terms of the revenue side. Just registering my concern. Thank you. Thank you. OK, great. Uh, I think all we have left is, are there any announcements? Oh, do they have to take action? Are we approving it? Well, approving they, it in June? they've asked you to set a hearing on June 21st. Okay, so, yep, well, I need a motion to schedule a budget adoption hearing. So we will move the staff recommended items for item two. So moved. Moved. Sorry. Seconded. Uh, roll call. Director Wolf. Aye. Adam? Aye. Hartman? Aye. Richardson? Aye. Uh, Lizaldi? Oops, he's gone. Mosby? Aye. Bennett? Aye. Clark? Aye. Maria? Aye. Waterfield? Aye. Aye. Sierra? Aye. And Chair Lavanino? Aye. Motion so, passes. great. Yeah. Are there any other announcements? Uh, next meeting is May 17th. And no, nope. not be June 21st. June 21st. Sorry, babe. All right, Director Santa Richardson. Barbara. I want to re Great. I want to remind you that there is a appeal board uh, meeting, appeal board nominating meeting right after oh, this right. meeting. Hearing board. Hearing board yes. Thank you. No, thank you. And we can do that in here if there if because uh, we have three in here for them uh, for a. Very good quorum. job. Thank you, Jim. Where we want to do it. Well, you guys figure out wherever you want to do it. Yeah. But with that, we will adjourn yeah. and June 21st, 1 o'clock. All right, thank you. So it's Jim and Peter, and who's the third one? Thank you.